Because introduce yourself, thank and you, then we'll have you. a seat. And go ahead and introduce yourself, boss. How you doing, everybody? Jamal Boulder, aka Saint Elsewhere. Um, number one, I'm a servant leader, Web three enthusiast, and big on tech and community. So. Thank you for having me here, Man. ladies. Thank you for having us here. I, I, I had to, I, I, and also I'm here because I have a special affinity for Wyandotte County, being from there. That's my hometown, so I will represent that all over the world. Because yeah, you will be all over the world with this. Exactly. But uh, if anything, I'm a storyteller. Yeah. So uh, I'm a raconteur. I'm a raconteur for the culture and the things in Web three. Yeah. So really, what I do is I like to just talk about what I've experienced in that space. Yeah. And kind of share that with people and how it's allowed me to connect with different communities, different cultures, and people all over the world. Exactly. And just kind of invite them to take a journey into that into that story. Yeah. But to do that, you have to have understanding. Like you gotta know what Web3 is, exactly. you gotta know what a Bitcoin is, you gotta Blockchain, understand all like, those things. how to access these things. Exactly. Because it's an opportunity that's available for everybody that right now has a very low uh window of entry, meaning like it's easy to get in. Yep. And a huge opportunity. And that's not always going to be the case. Exactly. So, yeah, I'm glad it's, we're here, man. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a fun time to talk about. I mean, just on this, the change of just Bitcoin itself. Between, I'll, I'll say from on my side of things, I did a fantasy football league last year where we had 10 people. We all bought in at $50 each. Basically, the pot was $500. And so throughout the season, what we did was track the price of Bitcoin. So when we bought in, Bitcoin was about $25,000. So when we got it, it was about, like I said, the $500 at $25,000. Now that same pot, which I did not touch, is $1,000. Yeah. Nothing changed. All that changed was simply just the appreciation of Bitcoin going from $25,000 to $50,000. So now we're in a space where things like investing is more accessible to the everyday person, specifically starting with Bitcoin. But now what we want to do is also teach people how you can be able to understand the underlying stuff like blockchain, why it's completely different from all the other tech that we're currently doing. That's a little more in the weeds, but today we just want to focus on just the baseline things, understanding NFTs, cryptocurrency, how we got to the Web3 space and stuff like that. So yeah. take a seat and then we'll get yeah, into the cool, presentation. Man. Get into the presentation. I just want to uh, shoot, share a story with the people. Right? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move my thing real quick if you don't mind. I know you, you stream it live. I'm just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me grab. Uh, I'm documenting mine. I'm not live like you. I didn't know we was going to be live. Excuse me, y'all. What's up? You know, hey, uh, say elsewhere. S A I N T E L S E W H E R E, YouTube, IG, uh, Jamal Boulder on LinkedIn. If you want to look that up, I'm a real person. So, all right. I'll I'm going to move this right here. here. Y'all, excuse me. I'm documenting the process while we do this. So, yeah. All right. So yeah, I was all, bro, I was nervous too, man. I was coming in, I was like, I ain't even have, I, I was trying to think of an elaborate setup. Yeah. I didn't know what kind of elaborate setup I would have. Like, I was like, okay, how do I, what do I set up for, to tell somebody about Web3, like a sign or something like that? Or, it, it's, it's, it's tough uh, to start, but <laughs> um, just to start, so this will basically cover today what we'll go over. So I'll put together an ebook. Um, I'll give, like I said, anybody that wants a copy of that today, I'll be able to send that to them. So any questions that you have, basically what we're going to do is go from the start of what is Web3, and then we'll just move through the whole process. So I'll basically read out the things, and if you can't really be able to see any of those things, let me know, and I'll basically uh, answer any questions, and then me and Jamal will cover those things on the in-between. So to start, um, just the table of contents. So we're going to go over the introduction of Web3 and the decentralized web. Uh, what is blockchain? What is cryptocurrency and how does it work? The different types of cryptocurrencies, fungible versus non-fungible, introduction to non-fungible tokens, so NFTs, the different types of NFTs, what makes NFTs different, the possibilities of NFTs and digital assets, and then buying and selling those NFTs, storing and securing your cryptocurrency and digital assets, and then basically the future of Web3 as a whole. So basically, we'll kind of just go over the whole spectrum of things in Web3. Um, it's a lot to cover, but we won't really go into the weeds on too many things, so that way we can keep people interested. So uh, just to start, so uh, 
if I could get a show of hands, when did everybody start using the internet? Probably did, did would the nineties be fair to say for some people? About nineties, two thousands maybe. Around the nineties. Born into the internet. Yep. Uh. <laughs> some of us were, was born into it more or less. Not using it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So and and chime in whenever you whenever you feel Oh yeah. Especially too. So the internet in the first part was the nineteen nineties to two thousands. Basically you have MSN, Internet Explorer, and AOL. That was your first internet, very basic. That, you couldn't be on the phone and on the nah, internet at the same time. Somebody pick up that line. Hey, hang up that phone right now, yo. Exactly. It's like going to go crazy. I remember. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. And see, it, everything was very analog. And so to be able to get internet, they had to send it in the mail. And so that was the first iterations of the internet. And, you know, there was commercials about, hey, this is why you should use the internet. Yeah. You can go to the library. You can go to the museum. And but, so, okay, so just like the library, though. Yep, the, fir the first internet pages that you went to, all you could do was look at them. Yep. You couldn't, there was no, you could click on anything. There was no ad to click on. There was no, I'm going to sit. You, it was just like reading the paper. Yep. That I was think it. That, that's probably one of the biggest, the biggest points about the first stage of the internet. It was just read only. Yep. It was basically all you could do was put your... Your blog, put your newspaper, put an alert, no interaction. There was no e-commerce or anything like that. Yeah, you just go to the website, you read what's on the website. So creative people said that question of why can't we do these certain things, which led to the second part of the internet, which is basically everything that we're currently doing now. You can shop, you can watch videos, you can buy and sell things. You can, you know, you have your banks now that are online and you can be able to do those things because before you really couldn't do too many online payments. That's true. Yeah. So then now finances started to change. Money started to change. Healthcare started to change. And now innovation started changing because creativity was now added to the space. So then now we have Netflix, Meta, Google, uh, well, Google, Google Drive, Twitter, Amazon, all those big corporations that we know now. Basically, the Magnificent Seven, as they say. Yeah, but more than that, like, also, you can, you're not just reading the internet. Yep. You can go online, and now you can see something. You can click on it and buy it, or... You can change it. Yeah, or you, I can talk to you. I could be on Snapchat and send you a text, or on Facebook, and I can chat with you. I could Like, you couldn't stream. do that. that yeah. was, I think Mark Cuban was probably one of the bigger ones who sold out and got... I want to say that he sold his streaming company for a hundred million dollars yeah. to start, and that's basically he took that money and bought the. Oh, I want to turn it off. He took that money and bought the Dallas Mavericks. Yeah. Which, as we yeah. very much don't know, he just recently sold for another three billion dollars. So he started a streaming company, sold it for a couple hundred million, took about two hundred and some odd million dollars. Bought the Mavericks, owned the Mavericks for about mm. 10 years or so, flipped that into $3 billion, and now he's one of the, he's one of the bigger, I would say, influencers in Bitcoin adoption, Ethereum, and all these different type of cryptocurrencies that we'll get into. But we're starting to see some of the big time. In, so he was someone Ethereum. who started early in Web, web 2.0. And he's now moving into Web 3. Gotcha, which, gotcha. What would you say is probably the biggest de facto problem of Web 2? Uh, ownership. Yep. Verification. Yep. Like sometimes it, it, there's about to, it's about to be a point to where with AI and everything with videos, you're not going to be able to tell what's real or not yep. looking at the Internet. Exactly. And so how do we authenticate these things? How do I have ownership of things? Like that's, that's really one of the things the that's missing. Because... I don't know if it, how many uh, people in here have seen the recent video release of OpenAI's new video generated uh, videos. It's called Sora, S O R A. Yeah. So yeah. basically, to sum it up, so last year when OpenAI came out with their videos, they had this thing of Will Smith eating spaghetti. Basically, it looked terrible. It looked like almost like a Picasso video, and like nothing like kind of went together. But then now, between now then realistic. Yeah. in a year, it's probably more realistic than real life. Yeah. And so one thing that's important when it comes to ownership is authentication. We're moving into an election year. 
that when videos and audio starts coming out of a supposed campaign person, a presidential elect, how do we know what's true or not? They have yeah. the same thing with Kenny Lewis with the Atlanta thing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I think go ahead. It's, well, it's the thing where technology is moving very fast. Everything is changing very fast and people aren't realizing it. And so it's a, it's at a point where it's going to get to the point where you it's, things are indistinguishable and you're not going to be able to tell. And a yeah. lot of people aren't aware of that that's happening right now. Yeah. I think uh, one of the things that we're, right now we're seeing AI is moving so fast. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of content, pictures, video, audio, but we don't know who's making it. We don't know where it's coming from and we don't know how to trust it. So in, when it comes to most people don't think it's a problem now, but what happens when AI starts writing history and starts telling you what happened years ago? So now history now used to go to the victor. But if I got the best technology and I can write it the best and give you a video that looks the best, then essentially I kind of move into this space where how do you tell what's different? So that's where we get into the whole space of my computer went off is the Web3 space. Web3 is really the decentralization of ownership. Right now, it's centrally owned in your Netflix, Meta, Google and all these places. All of them own all your information. When you say I agree or I allow in that long terms of service, they say we can do whatever, whenever with all your information. So your health records, they taking it and flipping it like, like drugs on the street. They selling it to the, the highest bidder. And that's what it is, is that at the end of the day, they will take your, they will take your information and sell it to the highest bidder, no matter what. Healthcare, your banking records, your energy records. Shoot. Yeah, it's, it's about IP on your internet. Okay, we say IP. So, yep. All right, so we got to tell people inter IP is basically intellectual property. Go ahead and break that down. It, while it, I'm intellectual there. property, meaning property that you created, that you own. You you you, you wrote something. Mm -hmm. You created. A, you wrote a story. You made a movie. You wrote a piece of art. You you, you know this is your intellectual property. Your photography that you did. Your your painting that you made, your song you wrote, your beat that you created, that's all part of intellectual property, right? Yep. And so you want to be able to protect that and prove that it's yours. What Web3 is allowing people to do is utilize technology that basically gives them the key or you, you, can't, you can't fake it. Yep. It's like if we created a system that you, that's built on contracts, we don't have to trust each other. Exactly. Because the system is made to where it's dummy proof. Yep. Um, and that's pretty much what it is. And also, it's everyone can see it. It's trans. You can see what's happening on here. No one can hide from this. So it's like it just puts it takes it out of everybody's hands. It makes it easy to understand, easy to prove and verify that this is yours. Yep. And now that you can prove and verify it, you can actually make money off of yep. it i think one of the things and, and if anybody has any questions in between we can definitely chime in as well too one of the big things specifically that i go over with people is that we're at a stage in life where before technology word of mouth was your verification if i said i was going to be somewhere you would expect that i was going to be there now if i say that i'm going to call you or i texted you or i emailed you there's proof now word of mouth has become a inefficient way of doing verification because if I said I texted you and then now we come together and I show you that hey I sent this text but you can show that I never received the text yeah. now we'll figure out okay well what happened maybe it was a disconnect or something of the sort because there's a lot of times where we'll get mad and be like oh okay you didn't text me or how many times is I oh I sent the money mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah that's number one. Oh, yeah, I sent the money. Okay. Now, with open source technology, everybody knows when the transaction goes through. It goes straight to you. Whatever I send him, I can yep. now send it directly. It'll say it's verified on my side and it's verified on his side. Both parties should be able to be good. And that in between is the technology. So now we've come to a space where 
we trust technology more than we trust people. Mm. That's the thing is that most people don't understand. And it sounds crazy, but really, we trust technology more than we trust people. Even, even, even with your statement, even though humans are inputting the code or the um, algorithms or the technologies for you to even make that statement, you still think you trust the technology more? We do to a point because of the fact that for because of the when you have things like closed source technology that we currently have with Web2, we trust those things. But then now what you said is that we have to trust the middleman in between us. So I have to trust that the cash app in between is going to get my money from me to cash app to you. But Thanks. we need to create a way for it to get from me to you without somebody Correct. in the middle. And that's where the whole Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network has come. And one of the major things I say all the time is that nobody does peer-to-peer -peer or word-to-mouth, word-of-mouth better than the underserved communities. Because mm -hmm. of the fact that you have less technology and you're built on trust. You're built on human, human capital. So then now, we've been doing NFTs for the longest. I'm such and such a son. Go down to this person's house and go get these cakes. She's going to give it to you for <laughs> half off. Yeah. Who's the NFT in this space? It's the kid. Can't make the kid. <laughs> you can't make it. Well, you, can't, you can make another one. They're going to be the exact it's same. It's not going to be the exact same kid. Yeah. I've known this kid for yeah. 10 years. So it's, we've been playing the game of peer to peer and decentralization for a long time. We just didn't have the technical pieces to make it make sense. So now we'll get into the next part, which is basically the blockchain. So blockchain is a little more complex version of it, but the simpler way I would explain it is basically the blockchain is an open ledger. Think of a ledger as a notebook. At the end of the day, a bank is really just a ledger keeper. Yeah. Really. The Not bank doesn't make money. Yeah. All they do is you come and put $10, I'm going to keep track of whatever you spend in between of that $10. And what you'll pay me is for keeping track of your money. But you go to Chase right now and tell them, let me see your letters. They're going to walk you out in cuffs. <laughs> they won't. Go back there. I, I want to see all the books. I want to see every transaction that this bank has done. They think you're crazy. And why is that? <laughs> that's not that's not how that works. They don't know. No, 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 no. It's because it's a closed ledger. Yeah, they, they can't. You, yeah, you don't know. They don't want you seeing everything that go on. No. And that's one of the key things with Web3 is that Web3, I don't have to trust Chase. No offense to them. But I, I don't have to trust U.S. Bank. I don't have to trust Macy's. I don't have to trust these people because now I can go verify myself on the ledger that I have $100,000 in my account. That I sent such and such $20,000. So now when it comes to nonprofits, donations, a church is one place where we talk about yeah. Where's my money going? On the blockchain, what would happen in a church is, for instance, the blockchain is the church. Let's say all of us in here would be the blockchain. Such as one person gives $20 to me, it will get broadcast. What you're seeing is that it will put into this block. The block is basically like a mail envelope saying that there's $20 in here given between me and him. Now it'll go to the community in this sense and say, hey, is there $20 that came from him? And is he getting something out of it? Everybody will vote yes. Once that goes through, it gets put onto the ledger, and then it can't get changed. Boom, done. So that's basically how a blockchain transaction goes, is that an action will happen, it gets put into a block, the people that are in Bitcoin, they say miners, or the people that are validating these transactions, similar to the bank was our validators, yeah. Now, we are the validators. See, Rich, hold up, hold up, Rich. See, I love it, bro, but like, you super, you super you bring smart, it bro. Like, I be, I be, I, I had to, for me, I be like, I got to know it like I'm five. So okay, like, like, the way I broke it down like I was five, right? Like, I was like, yo, if I had my toys, yep. the blockchain would be the toy box. Because yep. it's secure. A locked toy, I could put all, but see, if only one kid controls all the toys, 
He's like, I'll put him in. I can't trust that one kid to control no, all the toys in the, the toy toys. box, he right? Keep all the toys. And he's the only one that gets the key. Now that's that's, that's how that's banking forbidden. and everything works right now, right? Yep. With this though, like blockchain is, we all can put our toys in this in this secure toy box. It's gonna keep them all safe, but everybody gets their own key, mm. and you can access whatever toy you put in this toy box anytime. Yeah, and if I want to let you, if I want to let you use my toy though, you can ask me. Yeah, and I can let you use it. And I can be like, "Hey, what's what's your key so I can send you my toy?" What's your box? Yeah, what's your box address. Yeah. so I can send it, and I can send that. Easy. You can send it back to me right there, just like that. And you don't need to know somebody else's bank. Facts. That be that would be between us. Yep. I'll let you. Hey, that's between us. But it, but you know, normally right now it's like, oh, you want some of this? Some one person controls every toy in the toy box. Prime prime example, and I'll go. This is not complex, but this is a little bit more to where people understand. Right now, we can all have dollars, but maybe I have a bank that has Zelle, but I, another person has a bank that doesn't accept Zelle. So these two people can't talk to each other. Thanks. But we both have dollars. His dollars is the same as my dollars, but we don't have the communication to be able to talk between the two of us. Something like a Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency, which we'll get into next, allows us to basically speak the same money language without somebody being in the middle. We're all speaking in dollars, but if you have Cash App and I have Venmo, I can't send you money. If you have Zelle and I have Cash App, I can't send you money. Thanks. So it's, we're operating on the same system. We're all breathing the same air. We're all using we're, the same money. But we can't talk to each other. So it's like we all have the same money, but we're speaking Chinese and he's speaking Italian and he's speaking. So that's basically what we're doing. And because of these, all these different middlemen in between, that's where the fees come. Correct. They charge you because it's like when you land in, if you want to change your money in a foreign country, they charge you. Why? Because there's a difference. Because they got to make money. They got to exchange the money. Yep. And so now that's what it becomes. That's what the business of banking has become. So the next would be basically what are cryptocurrencies and how do they work? So give me a simple explanation. Do you want me to give a uh, explain it like I'm five? Uh, break it down, break it down, bro. Let me. All right. So, cryptocurrencies work like this. Everybody understands how reward points work. Amex, mm. Price Chopper points, Starbucks points. Everybody understands how these different type of point systems work. Yep. Think of America Express as your ecosystem, and your points are your cryptocurrency. All it's simply allowing you is a currency that you can spend on the America Express ecosystem. Yep. On Capital One, your Amex points don't mean anything. Thanks. Discover it doesn't mean anything. Thanks. Same thing. I'll break it down to five-year-old version. Chuck E. Cheese tokens <laughs> are the cryptocurrency of Chuck E. Cheese. The blockchain is Chuck E. Cheese, the business itself. Thanks. If you have a million dollars and go to Chuck E. Cheese and say, I want to play this game, they're going to look at you and be like, I don't care. You have Buy to have a token. token. <laughs> so again, the things that we're doing in Web3 is not foreign. These are things that kids participate in every day. So I have to get this toy. I have to have a certain amount of tokens to play these games, to get these tickets. And then you realize that it's just the same concept. You go to Starbucks enough times, you get enough points, what happens? You get, you get a, a free, free coffee. coffee. But you can't take that Starbucks coffee to Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> I, you can, I got these Starbucks points. I want to use them at Dunkin'. No, it doesn't work like that. Continue on that. Why, why is that important? Because it's, that's who controls that very area. That, that's Dunkin's metaverse. That's Starbucks. This is their world. They control. They, what they create, they can control. Yep. So Starbucks created Starbucks points, so that's why you use them. You can't use Starbucks points at Dunkin' Donuts. Starbucks doesn't want you to transfer and be able to use them at AMC. No. Because why? Now, they're not being spent to Starbucks. So Starbucks has no incentive to do a partnership with AMC. Why? Because, well, my points is going to get spent on a movie. They're not going to be spending coffee, and that doesn't work for me. Yeah. And, and, and because, I don't know, they like the largest bank holder and that takes away their, their uh, yep their liquidity oh, they literally that's a very valid point yeah. one of the biggest things that Starbucks uses 
is the the ability to leave your money on the app they take that money go to the bank oh. and say hey we have one point x amount billion yeah. dollars sitting here yeah, sure. yeah. give it's us a loan bank. yeah Think about the people that forget about their account, stop drinking coffee, all this money just sitting there. Starbucks is like, shoot, we going to use it if you're not. Correct. So that's another thing points. like what you were talking about. Yeah, and they gave them the points. You can't transfer your points from place to place. Mm -mm. With cryptocurrency now, what it allows you the, the ability to do is you can now take your pesos, transfer it into Bitcoin or any other currency. I'll speak to Africa. Yeah. They are obliterating the, the fiat money or the government money in Africa. So I can take Zimbabwe dollars, get cryptocurrency, and transfer it into any type of currency on the planet. Euros, yen, yuan, whatever it is. And now I am part of a global monetary network that I wasn't a part of Correct. if I was only holding Nairas. So now it allows people access to the financial markets in a way that they never have done before. So that's another Correct. reason why cryptocurrency is very important. So you hear terms in cryptocurrency, you hear the blockchain, obviously we went over that. Private keys, basically it's like your password. Wow, that's so real. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so those can range. So depending on the exchange, and this is where the free market competitiveness comes from, different exchanges will have different fees. So then now, just like if I go to Chase, they'll have a better savings account. U.S. Bank will have a different one and all these different places. So now they'll compete. So basically for you, it allows you the ability to say, hmm, this is the best place for me to purchase it because their fees are 1%. Or... Their fees is 2%. I'm going to buy my money on Cash App compared to Venmo. So then now you can be able to arbitrage the exact same way and figure out where is the best place to spend your money. So, But the fees on this are not determined by one person. It's more so determined by the entire market. So what it's called, um, and what you, what you talk about fees for transfer, transfer rates, what they call that in Web3 is gas fees. And that's the cost of making a transfer. And what that does is it's determined by how many people are actually trying to use the network at that time. So if there's a lot of people on the network using it, there can be higher gas fees. If it's not that many people, the gas fees are lower. But some people can create their own cryptocurrencies where they have no gas fees. So like he was talking about, I have my own gift card or my own points. You value Starbucks points because you like Starbucks. If I like Dunkin' Donuts, I don't care how many Starbucks points you give me. I like Dunkin' Donuts, okay? So what this is doing is it allows you to have, if you got a bunch of Starbucks points, you could say uh, how much I could trade these for Dunkin' Donut points. You can actually convert them to Dunkin' Donut points. And it gives you the ability to do that for, for anything. So it's like, all right, we can always now transmute our money. Just like he's saying, Zimbabwe dollars could now you put in the Bitcoin, dollars. which you could then sell for dollars. Yep. So it's like it, it makes it makes it just gets rid of all the exchanges. It just gives the power back to the people who are utilizing it. Yep. Probably one of the best. But all the, but right. also at the same time though, like even with that power, you got to have the knowledge to use it though. Exactly. Because without the knowledge though, it's like you just as they say, with well, great power comes great responsibility. That's yep. one of the things that I think that one people people are scared of cryptocurrency is the responsibility of it. Yep. Many people say they want freedom, but one thing I say is that most people don't really want true freedom because true freedom is all responsibilities on you. You can't blame anybody. Facts. You can't point the finger. If you are truly free, if you get in a bad predicament, it's because of you. If you lose your Bitcoin, it's because of you. If you lost your NFTs, it's because of you. And most people wow. want the FDIC insured assurance that, hey, my money is safe where it is. But is it really safe when, and I'll speak from experience, my bank account, my business, and my checking account got closed. And nobody at the bank from top to bottom could tell me where my money was. Hmm. 
And that's a business. And so my question really is to many people, many people don't think about this until it's too late. If your main bank account closed today for the next 30 days, how would you access money? Money has become, it's the next thing, there's oxygen, there's electricity, there's all these type of things that we have now become dependent on. The snowstorm hit and there was no electricity in my house. I had no way to cook food. I then now realize that, oh shit, I have no ability to survive for the next two, three days if left on my own. Mm. Most of us don't realize that we are so dependent, as independent as we think we are, we have been put into society to a point where we are fully dependent and cannot sustain for ourselves. Mm. Monetarily, food-wise, energy, and those are the three components of life. Yeah. So now, when you realize that if my money, if my money is cut off from me, I basically I can't go get food, I can't put lights on, I can't drive anywhere, I can't go to work. Without money, you might as well be dead, in, in all honesty. Not to say that money is everything, but money is right there next to oxygen. But then what is the, the, then the, my question is, what is money, though? That's a very valid question. And that's, that's the thing. I think, like, what people don't really, like, people think about money, they're like, all right, cool. It's, uh, it's, it's you know, it's, I need lots of dollars and everything like that. Okay. But it's only valuable because people yep. put that value on it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Case in point, what is money? If I if I were to ask everybody in here, what what is money to you? I say medium of exchange. Medium of okay. exchange. Okay. Any other any other points? Well, the Bible says it's the answer to all things. Answer to all things and medium of exchange. Okay. Okay. I mean, that's what's, what's that, those are good answers. Medium to exchange. I like your answer too. Yep. <laughs> Facts. Facts. I, I'll tell you, and look, and I, I like to bring this up because I I literally advise people on this and tell them, hey, don't trust the bank, don't do this. Da, 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 da. This is last year. As I was telling people and working with clients, mm -hmm. I was going to go pay my bill, and I look and I'm like, I have a zeroed out credit card and no money in my account. This is a. This is not no little credit union. This is a pretty prestigious bank. I'll keep yeah. the name out of it because they may be a sponsor down the road. But you know what I mean. <laughs> you know what I mean. So, yeah, yeah, but yeah. at the same time too, like I had nothing, and I called the executive without getting too much into it. I went from the teller to the banking executive of the business department, corporate. Oh, you walked all the way up. Okay. Escalated all the way up to the tippy top. Little old me. I already knew with the whole Bitcoin thing that central banking is really a scam. They never had your money. Yeah. But for them to stage after stage after stage tell me, I don't know what's going on. There's no notes. This has never happened. We don't know what's going on for 30 days. Bear in mind, I had a bill due with them. They wanted their money. And the only thing that I had that was liquid at the time was Bitcoin. Monday mm. through Sunday, I was able to access it. Yep. And I had to, unfortunately, liquidate it to be able to take care of my business stuff. But, but you at I, least had it to be able to do that with, and you had access to it. But and I played, what, but what I played like a business game. 24 hours a day, right? 24-7. No, yeah. <laughs> Most people think they own stocks. Try to sell a stock on the weekend. It's not happening. Market's closed, baby. <laughs> so if I own a dog and I can't sell it on the weekend, do I own the dog? <laughs> if I own a car and I can't sell it on the weekend, do I own the car? If somebody can tell me when I can or cannot sell a thing, do I fully own the thing? You can't sell your house, even if you fully own it, without letting the government know. So do you fully own that real estate property that you fully own? And you got to end it's a process. Imagine, imagine I created a smart contract for my house, an NFT. Yep. And I said, look, I want to deed this to you. I want to make this your house. We could literally do that. Pull out your phone. I'll pull out my phone. All right. You want to do this, bro? Boop, 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 boop. All right. The house is now yours. Transfer ownership. Think about how many people don't even know where their deed is. And that's a, that's a record that will be on this ledger, which is the blockchain, which is a ledger that everyone can see that is just 
has been in stone and historical. Like, boom. So, so now it'll be like, hey, I transferred this to you. Is this my house is now yours? Which is huge, especially when it comes to the black community, because think about gentrification that happens in the inner city. Who owns what? Now, most people can't even be able to prove that they own their grandmama's house. And the city's like, well, since you don't got the paperwork, we'll just take it. But if I have something on my phone, no different from Apple Wallet, and I can yeah. be like, Oop. scan the QR code, you see that I bought this in X year, whatever it is, you saw the ownership never change. Yeah. Yeah. Changes everything. Yeah. So this right here basically just covers the different type of cryptocurrencies. Uh, there's obviously there's cryptocurrencies for payments. Bitcoin is probably one of the primary ones. You have things like Ethereum, Dogecoin, basically just a medium of exchange. And to kind of go back to the question of what is money, one thing that I've come across throughout my study of this whole sp space is that really money is just two things. It's a medium of exchange, but at the same time, too, you want it to use it as a store of value. Because at the end of the day, what you want money to do is you want it to buy you things now, or if I don't spend it, it can buy me more things for, in reward for not buying that thing now. So if I have $500, I should be able to buy this TV. But if I don't spend the $500, I want my money to be more or buy me more TVs in the future. That's why gold was probably seen as the best form of money because... So that's one thing I got to say, too, bro. Like, you, you bring it up some good stuff. But I think every time I hear people say money, I think I literally think dollars. There like, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just think, you know, people think that, bro. It's like, it ain't all dollars. So mm -hmm. it's like, I bought, like, I bought some... I didn't know what I was going to bring. Like, it ain't all just dollars. Yep. Like, everybody thinks it's just dollars. But, like, I'd rather have it's gold. Yeah, yeah. Oh, gold, 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 hundred dollar bill. You know what I'm saying? And that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. But like, even better than that, I keep all my, my stuff I need. Like, you know what I'm saying? Pass it, let me pass it around. Yeah, right so please pass it around. Yeah. Go gold hundred dollar, right there. It's golden dollar. Turn on the live. Little golden dollar. Can be if you want it to be. How much you willing? How much you want to pay for it? That's money. That's all it is. <laughs> so Picasso sold what? The Mona Lisa is a billion dollars. If I had a billion dollars, I probably wouldn't buy the Mona Lisa. That's a hundred dollar bills that cost more than a hundred. Yeah. <laughs> there was some real legal tender for you. That's money right there. Real money. <laughs> yep. That's how I feel every time I pay my bills. That's real. That's that. Now that's real dollars. That is legal tender. You put all them together, that would be actual legal tender. Legal money. You know what I'm saying? And you see, you see what they did with that. <laughs> that's probably almost like a hundred dollars in that bag right there. And actually, it's the same amount right there. Yeah. But like, I got that. For, I picked that up at the Federal Reserve. That's what they think of that. That's what they think of the cash dollars. Now this right here. Oh yeah, I got one of these solid, boy. too. <laughs> This is a Bitcoin. Well, not a real one, but it's just a representation. Yeah. But so when that started out, that thing was worth point zero zero less than a penny. Your Bitcoin right now, one Bitcoin is worth about fifty one thousand dollars. I guess U.S. dollars. Yeah, fifty one thousand U.S. dollars. Yeah. Uh, uh, you probably, you probably, I don't know. I don't know. They're, they're out there. Yeah. They're out there. They're <laughs> hey, yeah. Yeah. And now, see. that's the great thing, too, though. Gold is great. But the issue with gold is once you accumulate a certain amount, it becomes a security risk for you. Because if I have $100 million and I wanted to buy $100 million worth of gold. Yeah. It's probably going to take me about 10% of that to be able to secure that goal, which means about $10 million is going to go into me securing that $100 million. So, when you say secure, what do you so let's say, for instance, if I have, I would have to have top-notch security, probably a safe, more than, more than likely. If I got $100 million worth of gold, best believe it's probably going to be some bullets involved to make sure, because you're talking about big money. Yeah. Then you got to get a bunker and all these other things because $100 million is not no laughable money. 
So the math that they do, especially when it comes to reserving money, is that for basically you need 10% to be able to reserve any type of currency. So if you have $100 million, it's probably going to take you about 10% 10, 10 of maintenance. Same thing with cars is that if you have a $60,000 car, probably roughly about $6,000 in maintenance, roughly. So it's just that understanding of that's how maintenance usually goes for a boat. Anything that you that you may not own, probably about 10% is going to take. Somebody brought something up, though, in the crowd that was a good point. They called money a store of value, mm. a store of value. So this is where you're this is where you're storing your value. Right. Yep. So somebody also you brought up a point. You said gold. All right. I want gold, too. I like gold. You know? yep. sure. <laughs> yeah, I like gold. Yeah. But here's the thing. Where am I going to store my gold? Right. Mm -hmm. a, a safe or that's the thing about gold. Physical gold. At some point, it is hard to store your value in a safe place hard to or it move it or like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. A lot of people accept gold. But if all I got is this big chunk of gold and I need to be a get groceries, I can't chip off a little. <laughs> yeah, you know, and so that's where the, the dollar was based on gold. That was the idea to create these these paper dollars and to be able to do that with the fractionalization. Correct. And so, like, I want all of those things, gold dollars, but I couldn't store all that with Bitcoin. Even with cash now, like you say, you got it. It's all on my card, right? Yep. You have the idea of it. You think that's there, or you, you know, what I mean, you when you check it, you make it sure. But oh shoot, they hit you with this fee or this what? You know, you you can forget about different. Uh, a subscription you got for yep. uh, for a couple of years and just yep. be like never even knowing what's uh, what's going on. But so with, with this, I can have one dollar, uh, one hundred million dollars, and all, and all I need is at the end of the day, all I need. I'm gonna make it simple. I like I like visualizations, yep. man. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I make it simple. All I need are my my keys and my wallet, right? Yep. If I have my keys, which my keys are my passcode, yep, my 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 Your my, login. my login, my keys, my personal keys, yep, you can't have my keys, bro, yep, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I got my keys in my wallet. I'm good. I have all the things of value, my stores of value, yep, within this wallet. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, Bitcoin is big. It's not just it, when we call it, with blockchain technology. It's not that I just have my my cryptocurrency in my wallet or my money that I can spend for other things. I also have my valuables in this wallet. Yeah. My, my contracts to have my houses as an NFT, a smart contract, yep. my, my paintings, my, 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 my documents, my health doc, everything I have now, I have these things safely hidden in my wallet and my keys. And as long as I protect my, now I'm responsible for my keys. I gotta be, I gotta be responsible for my own keys. Yep. That's, that's the thing about this now. Somebody can't yeah. own but as long as I keep my keys, my if you try to get my wallet, you're not really gonna get into it. One, you have one thing keys. I was gonna even add on to the what is money thing. So with gold, one of the reasons why, so there's I wanna say five, but I think they say six. Don't quote me on it. Sound money principles. That basically throughout history, in order for money for a thing to be considered money, it has to adhere to these five things. So the first thing it needs to be portable, meaning that it needs to be able to move from place to place. So gold adheres to that, cash, Bitcoin, it can move place to place. Great. It needs to be fungible, meaning it can go one for one. So what we'll see here is you have non-fungible and fungible. So you'll hear non-fungible tokens and fungible. Fungible is a dollar. One for one, you'll exchange it. A Bitcoin, one for one. Gold bar, one for one. You always exchange those things. Non-fungible is first row tickets at the Super Bowl. Nosebleeds ticket to the Super Bowl. There's a distinct difference. Economy, first class. A Range Rover, Toyota Corolla. So the non-fungible is the distinct difference between the two. Art is probably one of the most depicting things. Yeah. A Van Gogh and a Mona Lisa. A Basquiat and a Van Gogh. They're all different things, but it's non-fungibly different. So you'll pay different amounts because of their difference between the two. Two-bedroom house and a five-bedroom house. Yep. So we understand non-fungibility is that you wouldn't trade me a five-bedroom house for a two-bedroom house. Why? More bedrooms, more utility, completely different. Mm -hmm. Is the house in Texas or is it in Miami? That's where now we understand the non-fungibility side of things of downtown costs more than the suburbs. Inner city costs less than downtown. 
That's the non-fungibility side of things. So really, it has to be, again, portable, uh, fungible, mm -hmm. meaning that it can be exchanged one for one. It has to be divisible. That's the point okay. that you're talking about. Yeah. Gold is hard because I can't sell small pieces of gold to be able to obtain small amounts. I can't go and get $5 worth of gold if I have an ounce. I have to find somebody to either shave it off or I have to find somebody that it will turn yeah. it into exactly so there's things that now it becomes inefficient to do with gold that's why we move to coins first then we move to because coins were heavy we moved to paper money but because paper money had to only move between me and you we couldn't send it overseas we needed electronic money Mm -hmm. So that's the evolution of money throughout time is that we started off with agri-beads in Africa to start. We'll go way, way back. Yeah. Agri-beads in Africa were little beads that they put together that they got from the sea. Put it into a necklace. I'd sell it between people. I know that you can't fake it. Nice. Great. We use it as money. Case in point of where money isn't just dollars. It's the most scarce thing that people value, that store of value component. Oh, yeah. So, it could be ahead. shells, it could be, I mean, it's wherever we exchange that we believe Jordan, we value Yeezys, for. Yes, whatever. Yes, it is. Like, it's, 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 we, the barter system was a real thing. Like, if, if, if you had chickens, if I'm here and I got no water, I got millions of dollars, but I got no water. I say, hey, bro, <sighs> I got this cup of water. I'm ready to pay, I'm ready to pay that 10 price. Amps. I'm ready to pay that price. Like, is what you value. And that's business, as we all know. Yeah. Solve somebody's problem. Get my water back. Hey. And you pay me 10 million. I'm good, thank you. That, <laughs> that's what it ends up becoming, is that really that we understand these things again. Yeah. It's not complex, it's just they've put all this terminology into it that we think that we don't understand it. So that now is non-fungible. I mean, it has to be fungible. Uh, the next one is that it needs to be uh, a store of value yeah. or in this case actually it needs to be a unit of account so it basically needs to be able to keep track simply easily now i know that it's one for one or it doesn't really change problem now that we have with the dollar is that a dollar is really not a dollar anymore every time they've printed money and this comes to the scarcity scarcity and unit of account is basically kind of the same thing in the simple fact that if you continue to print money, it becomes less valuable. If I have a limited amount of, I don't know, Toyota, Ford, or let's say Ford Raptor trucks or Range Rovers, and there's only 100, and the next year we come out with 25 of the same one, I've depreciated the last years. Yep. Anything like limited that comes out with more depreciates the old stuff. It's no different with money. You want to add on I'm, I'm just stuck on like how, you know, uh, a gallon of milk ain't what a gallon of milk used to be. You know, they did that thing on Home Alone where he uh, he bought like a certain amount of groceries in the movie. Mm -hmm. And the groceries was like only maybe $20, $30 or something <laughs> like that. And then somebody did a thing where they went and bought those same groceries today and saw like it was like quadruple the amount of what it used to be. And using the same amount of dollars, no, buying the same groceries, the same items, yep. it costs way more. The items have not changed. I would almost argue that they've gotten less in quality. And I would almost argue that the quality is going down and we pay more. Just since COVID alone, we increased the monetary supply by 40%. 40%. You think Joe <laughs> really it's but the thing is that we all say thank joe but the problem is that they've been doing this since 1971 the moment that they took away the dollar from the gold standard it's been monopoly money ever since we haven't been able to come to the correlation that we need something to tie money to for it to make sense for everybody so then now it just gets into the fact that we really need money to be some type of scarcity at the end of the day in order for us to value it so this really gets into the more NFT side of things. So non-fungible tokens really falls into the fact that this is the authentication more or less of all things. Anything under the sun that you know that can be owned and be proved as ownable online yeah. can basically be tokenized. Your shoes that's on your feet right now can be an NFT. 
Yeah. Yeah. How do we know this is real? Go check. <laughs> and I can see when this was created, when someone bought it, whether it came in, did it really come from the. Where, 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 where do you find the authentication? So those will fall on the blockchain. So there's multiple blockchains as we had before. Here, I'll show it here. So there's the multiple blockchains that you have here, if you can kind of see. Yeah. You can see that. Oh, make sure I can zoom it in a little bit. But so currently there's different blockchains. On those blockchains, they can create what they call a marketplace. So a marketplace is kind of like Etsy. Basically, you can just put, it's like Amazon, basically on steroids. Amazon only lets you sell physical things. On yep. here, you can sell digital things. You can sell physical things. You can sell IP. You can sell contracts just digitally. So on that blockchain, what they'll do is they'll show who created it, like what mm -hmm. you said, yep. when they created it, how many of them there are, how many times it's been sold. And the great part, and we'll get into this as well too, is that you can basically put a smart contract into it to where now you get royalties every single time it sells. So it has a unique ID for every item. Like a social security card. Correct, yeah. For every single thing that you put you up. You can there. never change this ID. Yeah. Because yes. now when they come out with an album, it's proof. You can't go out here and try to copyright it or whatever. There's only a thousand versions of this Death Row artist album and things like that. So NFTs falls into many things. Art, collectibles, music, gaming, property ownership, health records, supply chain tracking, educational records. Degrees will be NFTs here soon because I have no clue where mine is. <laughs> I know that's true. And it's like, just imagine how many people have PhDs, masters or whatever it is. You can't show it. What if you had a, on your wallet to be able to show at your next interview, hey, I have yeah. a master's in economics. And I yeah. can show it. Being able to authenticate those things. I got my business degree from Harvard. I took this set Google course. These things can be authenticated and you can be able to prove them. So this is just another thing of what many uh, different ideas that NFTs have kind of done, uh, particularly art. Um, there's a very innovative uh, project that basically had a bunch of little dots. They came together when you collect, when you bought more of them, they turned into a bigger dot, more or less, and it morphs over time. So this is a thing called dynamic NFT. So I can actually speak to that uh, of open editions where you you purchase it, and it's like once you purchase more of them, it changes into a different picture. So I participated in one of those, mm. but I didn't know that's what it was. I just liked the picture and I got it, but all of a sudden. It was completely different. Yes. But then also these are collectibles. So people try to buy these things. So they grow in value very quickly, almost like, like famous art. And whoever creates it or sells it, like I sell a painting for 10000 the artist doesn't ever get anything. If there's artwork in here, you sell, you make a painting and mm -hmm. you sell it to me. Yep. You made whatever I gave you. Yep. Right? You Imagine out. you get real popular and now I'm able to sell the painting. I bought from you for like 1000 I'm able to go sell it for... A hundred thousand. You don't get a cut of that. A regular painting. With this, you're able to get a cut of it off of, you get a percentage of it no matter how many times it's sold. Yeah. Because you always had that ownership of it and it keeps that identity. Yeah. Let's see here. Like, uh, we can track a vehicle if anything happens to the vehicle. We got an NFT on it. Ain't nobody going nowhere. Oh, my.